Well, good morning, church family. If you are out on the patio, come on in. We cannot wait to sing with you. If you're already here, would you stand up as we begin to worship through song?
Church, this morning we come to sing because there's a God who not only created this world, but there's a God who is worthy of our praise. And we get to join in this song that started way before we walked in here. Um, And we get to join in the throne room of heaven with angels and saints singing, Worthy are you, Lord. Listen to these words from Psalm 139, these ancient words that believers of that believers have have said and sung for for a long time. Listen to these words. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Some of you might be walking in here this morning feeling really alone, and it's good news that there's a God who's familiar with you who made you and knows all your ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. For some of us, that might be scary. (laughs) You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. And the psalmist goes on to bring the spectrum of human emotions to God. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens... You are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. We started the service singing who the Lord is, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, and he will not let the guilty succeed. He is a God of justice. The psalmist says, if only God, you would slay the wicked. And and this morning you may have heard... um, and when you come into church, just, just leave what you're going through at the door and come into worship. But that's not what we're invited to this morning. We're invited to bring everything that we are and everything that we're dealing with to a God who can handle it. He can handle anything we're bringing him this morning. Our anger, our doubts, our sin. He's with us in the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. And he's worthy of our trust. And so... We're going to take some time just to be still and know that he is God in silence. It might be the first time you've been quiet for more than 30 seconds all week. Just invite you to, maybe it's, maybe you need to just put your hands out and accept that that he's trustworthy this morning. Let's be silent. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Holy Spirit, you're the one who convicts. You're the one who transforms us and conforms us more into the image of your Son. We invite you, Holy Spirit. We say, come, Holy Spirit, and do your work this morning. Takes away the sins of the world. 
Have mercy on us. Hallelujah. Have mercy on us. Hallelujah. Have mercy on us. Hail our God. Takes away the sins of Kids, that word amen just means let it be so. And so children, first through fourth grade, as you go to your classes, would that be so? 
because of what you learn and because of who you become, would God receive glory. Um, the rest of you can have a seat. Well, good morning once again. It's great to hear the church sing. I love one of the things I love every Sunday is just to hear the church sing. Amen to that. I bet there's some parents here who are saying amen to children's ministry being back going again. Thank you, parents, for bringing your kids into the worship service the last few weeks. So that's been that's been rich. Um, we're going to continue to pray. Um, we've been praying through song. And uh, if you're like me, it's these themes of when we move from prayer to song to scripture that, uh, that my attention and can get distracted. So I want to invite us again, center in. We're gonna, what we're doing here is important. Don't let your mind wander. Let's, let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, Father in heaven, Lord of love and light, you who alone are God and yet are never alone but live in an eternal community of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We give you praise this morning, for you are the giver of life, the author of our story, author of every story. You're our hope and our purest joy. We thank you for the simple pleasures of life that we enjoy, things like clean air to breathe, good and nutritious food that sustains and delights us, soft beds to sleep in, and the beauty of a place like Santa Barbara to wake up to. We, we praise you for giving us a peaceful society, one that generally functions well, for friends and families and even this church community. Lord, we recognize these as gifts from your hand. And church, and just let's take a moment of silence again and just to quietly name other things before God that you're thankful for. Truly, Lord, you have been abundantly generous to us. In spite of all your goodness to us, we have not returned your kindness with devotion. We've not loved you with our whole heart. We've lived lives that look very much like those of our neighbors who don't know you. Rather than living as exiles in this world, too often have we lived as those who very much belong to this world. Lord, for our anger, our greed, our lust, and our pride, would you forgive us? And again, let's just take a moment in silence to confess your sins to God in confidence that he is a God who forgives. Lord, create in us a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within us. Cast us not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from us, but restore to us the joy of our salvation and uphold us with a willing spirit. Lord, we lament not only the things that have gone sideways in ourselves, but also the way our world has been warped because of sin. People have gone hungry because wealth is hoarded. Populations are traumatized by war because of how power is stewarded in sinful ways. So, Father, would you show your compassion to those who are suffering around the world today? We also want to pray for those who are suffering near us, whom we know well. We pray for your healing of Brian Eckhart as he continues to undergo cancer treatment. Would you help him with pain management? Would you shrink his tumor? Would you lift his spirits? For the many others among us who are suffering with things like heartache and physical pain, mental illness, 
in grief, Lord, have mercy. For those of us who are overwhelmed and worn out, be our strength. And again, just in a moment of silence, name before the Father spaces in your life and people you care for who are in need in need of God's provision and care. Lord, we're here today not because we have to, but because we get to, because you are God and we need you. And so we pray, Lord, would you fill us and help us Help us to believe even this morning that our sin does not make you look at us differently, that you never turn away in disgust, but that you long for us to turn and come to you again. Help us to trust that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Help us to see the goodness of every instruction and promise in your word. And to this end, we want to pray for Joanne as she's going to come teach us in a moment. We thank you, God, for her giftedness uh, through which you want to bless this church and fill her again today with your Holy Spirit and allow us to hear from you through her preaching today. For it's your glory we seek in our life and our world, and it's your voice we want to hear. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, two quick announcements. The first is that if you are a uh, 20-something, particularly if you're 23 to 29, we have a gathering tonight for young adults. We really hope you would come uh, join us. It's going to be in the living room, which is in the, the education building over here. If you go up the ramp and turn right, you'll find us. Six o'clock, there's going to be food. There's going to be great discussion. Uh, some of us have been involved with something called the Young Adult Leadership Lab through Westmont, which we've been learning and really had a lot of resonance for those who uh, were in that stage of life that attended. And we're going to share some of that and hear from you about um, just how we can continue to connect, encourage, equip uh, you for your generation in this church. Um, secondly, this Wednesday night, we're going to pick up our series again. Um, we're working through some spiritual format, uh, formative uh, practices. Uh, so we're watching these videos called Practicing the Way midweek. This one is on fasting, I believe, and uh, will just make for great conversation among us. Okay, that's it. Joanne's going to make her way up here. I've already met some new people who are here today. So as you uh, stand and greet one another, let's make sure everyone in here feels welcome. You know the names of the people sitting around you. Go for it. Let's go ahead and have a seat. We'll go ahead and have a seat and we'll get started. <laughs> All right. Well, as many of you know, since you've been coming, we've been doing a series of uh, talks this summer about what it means to live as exiles, people whose primary allegiance is about who we belong to, not where we live. So today we're talking about exiled work. Now, hearing that word on a Sunday might bring up all kinds of feelings for you. Like you might think, oh man, now I'm stressed, or it's too busy, or my work is boring, or I just got a new job and I'm really looking forward to it, or gosh, I wish I had a job. 
Or you might be thinking, I've been retired longer than the junior hires back there have been alive, <laughs> right? Um, so even so, wherever we're at, um, the question for today is how do we hold space in the world as exiles in our work? And I'm hoping in the next 20 minutes we can reframe how we think about work by looking at how our work fits into the bigger story of scripture. So to get there, first we've got to talk about what I even mean when I'm talking about work up here. So yes, it includes your job if you have one, but it's not limited to just that. It's about all you do, every stage of your life, every breathing hour. So Genesis 1 and 2 is where I want to take us to start this talk. First, to get a refresher by what we even mean by work, we're going to start in Genesis 1, right at the beginning, verses 1 through 5, if you've got your Bible open. I'll put it up here as well, and we're going to stay seated because I am going to be uh, flipping through a lot of scripture today. Uh-oh, there we go. Genesis 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Okay, so the question for us is, what is God doing here? He's creating stuff, right? I mean, we kind of know this story. He's making light in the darkness. He's taking what's chaotic and formless, and he's making it into something. And as the poem goes on, God creates a place to sustain life. He creates our planet. He fills it with plants and seeds and trees full of fruit and all the rest of the stuff. But here's what I want us to notice today. God is the first worker. I want us to notice God's work. God made something out of nothing. He brought order to our world so it could sustain life. So the people on earth would flourish. So what about God's work? God's work brings flourishing. In Genesis 2.9, we read he made it pleasing to the eye. He could have left it functional, but he wanted us to enjoy it. So he made it beautiful. So God's work brings flourishing and beauty. And I could stop right there because that's kind of kind of be my point today. If you're taking notes, write that one down and, and we're, we're pretty much done. And yet, I'm going to flush it out a little bit more. Um, some of us um, have been enjoying some of the pretty nice places around Santa Barbara. In fact, a bunch of you have been on some of the summer hiking groups that we've been doing through church together, and you've hit the trails. Uh, but imagine if pleasing to the eye wasn't something that was important to God. And if this hike up to Inspiration Point just looked like a long trek through a dirt hallway. But instead, it's beautiful. When you think about all the colors in the sunset or the smell of chocolate chip cookies or my backyard fence, which is covered in star jasmine, and in the summer, it all blooms. So the whole length of my backyard, and when I open my slider door, it's like perfume just hits me. God's work was beautiful. The sights, the sounds, the way food tastes, everything. And then look at Genesis 1.26. We're going to go on just a little farther. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Okay, so God made you and me in his image. He sets us up in this beautiful world filled with everything that we need to flourish. Why? Just because he wants to, because he loves us so much. He wants us around. That's who we are, the crowning glory of his creation, made in his image, extravagantly loved by God. And he gives us something to do. We get to carry on 
his work. That's what we do. We see it again in the retelling from Genesis 2, verse 15. The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Or a more literal translation would be to cultivate it and keep it. Now, I could spend the rest of our time together just talking to you about what it means to take care of creation, to take care of the created world. And that would be worth every minute we spent listening. But there are a lot of people far more qualified than me to bring that message. And it's such a big, work is such a big involved uh, talk. What I want to do today is narrow in and I want to emphasize about the people side of work. So here's going to be my point today, and I want to drive this home. We were made to be God's apprentices, his co-workers, doing what he does. He created life. We tend, he tended to its flourishing. He made it beautiful, and we use our God-given God creativity to add to that beauty. He did it for us, and we do it for the joy and benefit of everyone around us. So I'm going to say all that again. I flubbed it a little, so this time, let's get straight through. We were made to be apprentices, God's co-workers doing what he does. He created life, and we get to tend to its flourishing. He made it beautiful, and we use our God-given creativity to add to the beauty. He did it for us, and we do it for the joy and benefit of everyone around us. That is our great big job description in God's big story. So that leads me to the question that we might be asking, how are we doing? Like if we had to give humanity a performance review, how would you say we're doing? Not so great. <laughs> Maybe some of us are doing okay. You know the problem. It wasn't long after the invitation to join in this work that the humans just tore up their contract. You can read about that in Genesis 3, the fall of humanity, the great human boycott of all of God's wisdom and authority. And that rebellion came with consequences, like weeds and gophers. <laughs> you feel about them the same way I do, I can tell. <laughs> But more importantly than the weeds and the gophers, bad judgment and exploitation of each other and exploitation of the earth itself. Work isn't a result of the fall, but it is why it's so hard and discouraging and distorted. People got selfish, and instead of focusing on helping the planet and helping their neighbors to flourish and thrive, work morphed into a way to climb the corporate ladder and a lot of times on the backs of our neighbors. Whole industries exist to exploit the work of other people just so that we can get more stuff for less. A recent US De uh, Department of Labor report shows how the behaviors and decisions of businesses and consumers like us and governments lead to horrible conditions of labor abuse and exploitation around the world. In 2022, there was an estimated 160 million child laborers and 28 million adults in forced labor around the world. And they gave us a few examples. The way lithium ion batteries that power electric vehicles often produced um, in cobalt mines, mined by children in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Here is a boy. Uh, like Ziki Swayze, who was age 11 when he, would con he was conscripted to work in a dirt hole mining cobalt and had never been inside of a classroom. Some people get this beautiful hike while others get this dirt hole. And that is exploited work. Or it's the child labor to pick our bananas that come from Brazil or our instant cup of noodles made with palm oil from Southeast Asia. In the U.S., the most common venue for exploited workers are domestic workers. And parents, there's some kids still in the room, so I'm going to be sensitive, but we cannot leave out entire 
industries that exploit people's bodies like a commodity for self-gratification. There are a lot of people in the world that are treated like litter, like trash. Somebody threw on the trail that we just walk by. Now, I don't know what to do about this, honestly. I wish I could come to you with all the solutions. But I think at the very least, we can acknowledge it. We can talk about it. Maybe we can take inventory of how we're contributing to it. I bet we could all take a few minutes later today with whoever we're with to brainstorm some ways that we can contribute to flourishing instead of this kind of exploitation. We're a smart group of people empowered with a lot, so I challenge us to do that later today with whoever you're with. Were it not for God's extravagant grace, all the humans would be fired, right? We're not very good coworkers. And all of that is a long intro to where we find ourselves today. We are exiles in a world where work can mean, be a means to get what we want, and sometimes it comes at the expense of other people. Work has become the way that we measure our value, and if we're lucky, we get health insurance until we make it to Medicare, and then we retire on a beach somewhere. But, and this is the part where all the hope comes in, as exiles, as people redeemed by the work of Jesus, whatever we do, we do it for a different motive and a completely different vision. Uh, last month, Esau McCauley spoke at my kid's college graduation. And um, students in the room, you will appreciate this. What he said to a room full of people who had just worked for four years to earn their college degrees and are about to enter the job market, he said to them, do not chase greatness. Here's the full quote of what he said. God does not need great people. Do not chase greatness. What do I wish then for the class of 2024? That you will see Christ as he truly is, as glorious and all-encompassing. That you'll run after the one who first came running after you. That you'll discover now at the onset of your life, before you waste years doing whatever you do, the secret to happiness and peace. Isn't that good? He's talking about knowing first who you are, and out of that, doing what you were made to do. Made in the image of God to bring flourishing and beauty to the rest of the world as best we can now and perfectly when Christ returns. So our work, whatever it is, it will matter because as exiles, the one who gave us our job description is not the guy who signs our paycheck. And as our missionary friend Meryl Dick would say to the Pume, he is our Lord owner boss. Paul reminds us, Jesus bought us when he died for our sins, and we belong to him in every way, including all of our work. All of our work is his, every breathing hour. So that takes us to what I hope you will read with me as our primary text today. We're going to read together Colossians 3, 23 through 24. So will you read with me? Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Whatever we do, it's for the Lord. So think bigger than just a paycheck. Whatever you do, in Paul's language, means whatever you do. Whatever you do. You're doing something right now. You're worshiping and you're thinking about how to apply this to your life. You're bringing flourishing to the people sitting around you by creating space to listen. Good job, people in the back. You were just making beautiful music, singing together. Some of you are watching this on YouTube right now because while we're all in here, you're playing with all those kids that just left the room in our pre-K or maybe you're setting up for a youth group, getting ready. Tomorrow you'll be doing something else. Maybe you're going to look for a job or teach history or take care of babies or you're going to sit with an aging spouse. It won't always be fun or easy. There's going to be plenty of hard work until Jesus comes back. 
There'll be broken guitar strings up here on the stage. There'll be tantrums. Back in the other room, there'll be corrupted files. You're going to be frustrated with your caseload, and you're going to miss points on your chemistry tests. Paul's point here is to reset how you think about it all. Your work is not a measure of your worth. You don't have to prove yourself because your boss personally died for all your mistakes. It's one thing to say all that, but if we actually live that way and think it's true, it would change the way we think about our work, and it would change the set of obligations that we all have to one another. To start with, we'd care for our employees very well. Hopefully, we treat the people who pick our fruit with the same dignity as the one who makes a pick play. We'd focus more on bringing love and joy and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control into whatever we do. Whether that's at a carpenter shop or in a classroom, whether we're pouring coffee or bringing it to a friend in a skilled nursing facility. We won't do it perfectly, but we can inch closer to the, doing that for the glory of God and the good of the city, even right now, as exiles. I mean, that's the kind of person with a big story thinking that I would like to get on the phone the next time I call customer service. Right? <laughs> or we could be that kind of person if that's your job. Whatever you do, honor Jesus. He is who you really work for. And whatever you do, it has eternal significance. Colossians 3.24 and, and beginning in 23, whatever you do, work it out with all your heart. Verse 24, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. Okay, now another uh, honest moment here. I don't know what that looks like. I can't really tell you. But I can say that whatever that reward is, we want it. It's going to be good. I can say that for sure. And I can say for sure that Paul is actually saying whatever we do has some kind of eternal significance. He brings it up in another place, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, um, at the end of this long chapter, in verse 58. It's a whole chapter where Paul makes this long case for the resurrection, for why we should believe that there's more to just this life. And after 57 verses convincing us about the resurrection, uh, N.T. Wright describes where Paul takes us next, and it's not where you'd expect. And he writes, says, what is Paul going to say after writing a whole chapter on resurrection? Is he going to say, since there's a resurrection, spend your time looking up, waiting for this glorious future? No. He says, and here comes the verse, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. He doesn't tell us to look up, he tells us to work. N.T. Wright goes on to say, your work is not in vain because everything you do by the power of the Spirit in union with Christ flows out of love and hope and grace and goodness and will somehow be part of God's eventual kingdom. Not that we're working for our salvation, but by our work, we're adding to something that lasts in the new heaven and the new earth. So I want to have you help me end this by encouraging one another. So we're going to have a brief time of sharing. And my prompt is going to be this. How have you seen each other do the work of bringing flourishing and beauty to other people? And I'm going to, while you're thinking about that, I'm going to kick us off with a story that I heard this week. Um, Krista Beard and I went for a walk. Uh, we went for a hike in Tucker's Grove Park this week. And she told me about the homework club that some of you were involved in. Um, in fact, she gave me a list of, of all the people she could remember who had been involved over all the years. And I can see a lot of you are sitting in the room. She told me how she, as a teacher, moved into the old town a Goleta neighborhood where she taught school. And then she went around living there, knocking on doors of her neighbors, recruiting some of you as mentors, and made space in her backyard for homework club for kids to flourish for years. 
And then she told me, even though she's not doing that right now, she's still living in the neighborhood and involved with the families, um, that there are, there are kids who have grown up now that she has been involved with for all these years and that many of you have mentored. That work brought flourishing. Now, I want you to have a chance to share. You might add to that story if you're one of those people who are a mentor. Um, but if not, I want to hear your other stories. Keep it brief, and let's hear a few of them. Please stand and speak loudly and tell us what I've written up here. How have you seen each other bring flourishing to other people? Amen. My kids were part of that. Thank you. Beautiful.
All right. Well, with that, we, we've just heard some of the ways that our work brings life to other people, and there's so many more stories in this room, I know. Um, Jesus invited us to come to his table to remember the work that he's done for us. In John chapter 6, after Jesus fed a crowd of people, they came looking for him. Maybe they were just hungry again. Um, and he told them this, John chapter 6, verse 27. He said, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Now later, that same crowd was there, and Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And Jesus is inviting us to his table. We're going to have prayer teams on the sides and in the back. And when you're ready, would you come and take the bread that reminds of us of his work, his body broken for us, and take the cup, the wine, that represents his blood shed for us. Would you come and remember the work that Jesus did for all of us that he invites us to share? Amen. Since my father's word into my listening, all nature sings and rallies the music of the spring. This is my father's word.
Jesus, be the glory in the earth and in the church forever and ever. Amen.